Okay, well, here. So, the next talk is by Guillermo Gallego on multiple bundles and involution. Thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to give a talk in front of such a distinguished audience. So, uh, this is joint work with Oscar. And, uh, well, you notice that in this talk, uh, there will appear a lot of objects that we have already been considering in during all these uh, talks. Um, that is not a coincidence, right? And so uh, I'll start by reviewing this uh, multiplicative Higgs vibration. Um, I'll start with the most simple apro approach, first not considering monoids. So my setting would be an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. And I'll start with a semi-simple, simply connected group over K. Um, I could be consider something more general, but for this talk, uh, I'll restrict myself to this assumption. And I'll fix uh, a border subgroup and, and a maximal torus. And then I consider an algebraic curve over K. Uh, I should consider probably I should consider it uh, projective, but um, okay. So now I fix some. If if I fix some natural number, I can consider this symmetric product of of the curve. So the elements of this symmetric product are just uh, effective divisors of degree d, and if I consider a tuple of natural numbers, I can just consider. I denote by this the product of all these uh, symmetric products. So if I have some sample of divisors, I can consider the sum of the, those divisors and the support of that divisor that I obtain as a sum. This is just notation. So uh, the stack of multiplicative Higgs bundles, well, this is, uh, of course, an abuse of notation, but it's the stack classifying mm -hmm. this uh, kind of uh, Samples, um, basically, so what do we have here? Um, these are pairs, uh, so very similar to Higgs bundles. Uh, e is a G bundle over my curve. And then uh, phi is a section, but well, for Higgs bundles, we would consider sections of the uh, adjoint Lie group, uh, oh, sorry, so the adjoint bundle of Lie algebras. In this case, I'm considering a section of the adjoint bundle of Lie groups, of groups, the adjoint group bundle. And well, uh, in the usual Higgs vibration, uh, one consider twist, considers twisting by some line bundle, just to get something that is non-trivial. Here we do something a little bit different, which is uh, we consider meromorphic uh, sections in some sense. So sections that are valued outside of this uh, device or the support of this device. So um, <clears throat> uh, in principle, this will be uh, not of finite type. So if we want something of finite type, we have to fix, uh, to prescribe the singularities in some sense. So, so to prescribe the types of the singularities in this support. And the way to do this is, um, to consider this uh, this loop uh, groups, so I'll consider if I take any point, any singular point, any point in this divisor, I then consider a formal variable around that point, and I have this uh, formal arc or formal loop space and formal sorry formal Lorentz series, formal power series. And then if I restrict my Higgs field to the this um, spectrums, then I just have a, a sun invariant, which lies inside this double coset of these positive loop groups, sorry, of this loop group by positive loop groups. So this has a very nice description, which is just the Cartan decomposition. So um, this is just uh, this, disappeared in Thomas Hausel talks, talk in his last talk. This is just like the, the um, description of the affine sober cell cells of the 
of the affine grass manian, which would be this the quotient. So these are just the the dominant uh, co-weights of of my maximal torus of my group. So uh, this invariant, I can consider this invariant to be some divisor with values in this uh, in this uh, set of dominant uh, co-weights. So if I fix some tuple of dominant co-weights, I can consider the stack of multiplicative G Higgs bundles with this prescribed type. Um, these are just uh, multiplicative Higgs bundles that, uh, okay, so this is like a formal scalar product, right? I, I just pair its, uh, its um, <coughs> sorry, its, its dominant co-weight with a, its divisor and the order on dominant co-weights extends to an order in these uh, value divisors. So I just ask that my invariant is bounded by this uh, by this uh, other divisor. So um, now I can talk about a multiplicative Higgs map associated to this stack of multiplicative G Higgs bundles. So this is just like the group version of the Chevalier restriction map. So the invariants of the ring, of the structural ring of the group are described in terms of invariants of the maximal torus by the Weil group. Uh, so in particular, there, there are some invariant functions uh, with uh, higher, highest weights, the fundamental dominant weights of my, uh, of, of my group uh, such that generate the the um, the ring of invariance. So this is just an, an affine space. And the multiplicative Hitching map, uh, in this, uh, let's say, somewhat naive description is just to evaluate the Higgs field on each of these uh, invariant functions. So, so the Hitching base uh, is a bundle over this symmetric product. And over each uh, tuple of divisors, I just have this. Um, I ha I have this uh, space of sections. So uh, I'm going to tell you some of the history of these uh, things. This appeared uh, originally in the late '90s uh, in the physics literature. So they, they are there, but uh, I don't know any precise references. I mean, I know where to find them. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they appear in the algebraic geometry literature in, in a great paper by uh, Jack Hurtubis and, and Markman, uh, where they study, um, they study this multiplicative hitting vibration as an integrable system. Uh, then they appeared um, in some kind of hitting Kobayashi style correspondence where they are related uh, with <coughs> singular monopoles. This is work of Charbonneau and Ortubis. And then this was extended by uh, Smith to general groups. And it, it has also been very widely extended in the work of uh, Mochizuki, this Charbonneau Ortubis correspondence. And then also uh, the multiplicative Hitchin vibration has been considered in, in the work of uh, Ngoa and his students. So originally it was considered in, in, in the work of Frankel and Go. And then um, the, there they suggest this monoid approach that I'm going to explain. And then it was further developed in the works of uh, Boutier and of uh, Jingren Chi. And then very recently in the thesis of Griffin Wang, uh, it was used uh, in a proof of the fundamental lemma, now the group version of the, of the fundamental lemma. So basically anything I say about the monoid approach will be a linear combination of the work of Boutier, Jingren Chi and Griffin One. So I'm going to explain a little bit this monoid approach. So, this has already appeared, and monoid is just a semi-group, so uh, it has a binar binary operation with associativity, with identity, and the invertible elements form a group. 
So an algebra in monoid is just a monoid object in the category of schemes. And, and we see that it is reductive if the unit group is reductive. So a nice example is just to consider uh, matrices. Matrices give a, a reductive monoid where the unit group is just GLN. Uh, an interesting way to think about monoids is as a, an equivariant of an embedding of its unit group. So in some sense, you can think of this as some kind of non abelian toric varieties, right? <clears throat> so monoids have a nice property, which is abelianization. If I take a reductive monoid with a G, so G was already fixed before. Uh, now I take a reductive monoid. I take its unit group. This is a reductive group. So I take the semi-simple part. And I ask that this semi simple part is G. Now I can take a quotient by the action of G times G through the action of uh, the unit group. This is a toric variety for this torus. Um, so this is the center of the connected component of the center of the unit group. And uh, this is a torus. And this is a toric variety for this torus. And this GIT quotient is called the abelianization of, of my monoid. So I, I have to make a quick warning because abelianization is a word that appears also in the literature of Hitchin systems. But um, I mean, it's something different, right? I mean, this shouldn't suggest anything about this. And also, um, maybe this suggests something like uh, some kind of Hitchin vibration, but that's not quite the point. The, the, this is just about fixing singularities, not the chain vibration will also be a GIT quotient, but something different. Uh, something else, so um, universal properties for categorical quotients uh, give uh, uh, commutative squares associated to it, to morphisms of monoids. <clears throat> and we are interested in excellent morphisms, which are such that this square is uh, Cartesian. So um, this already I said, I say that a monoid is very flat if this abelianization map is dominant, flat and with integral fibers. And we are interested in considering the category of very flat reductive monoids, uh, where the morphisms such that have a semi-simple part, uh, my starting group G, and with excellent morphisms, um, and with excellent morphisms. So this category has a versal object, which is the Wimber enveloping mon monoid. So I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about this, although Professor Prion uh, already introduced this yesterday. Um, so yeah, I, I start with this uh, semi-simple, simply connected group, and I consider this enhancement which cons consists on taking product with the maximal torus and then cosenting by the center. I consider the fundamental dominant weights and the simple roots of, of so I, I chose I chose a, a Borel subgroup and a maximal torus, so these things are well defined. And then um, um, this uh, Wimber monoid is just the closure of this embedding. So yes, I take the, Rho sub i is the ith, uh, highest uh, weight uh, ir irreducible representation. I consider the image inside of here, and then I multiply by this. Um, so I just evaluate this weight in the in the point of the torus, and yes, I I can embed somehow this group this group inside of this bigger monoid, and the closer of the image is just the the Bimber monoid. So some things I should say, this, this torus I considered before is just the, the adjoint uh, the joint torus, so cosented by the, by the center. And the abelianization of the, of the Bimber monoid is uh, our dimensional affine space, but, but considered as a toric variety for this, it's defined by the, um, well, I mean, is defined by the coordinates are given by the simple roots 
So the, the, the cone is given by the dominant uh, weight uh, cone. By the, by the fundamental white chamber intersect, intersected with the weight lattice of this uh, triad, of character lattice of this triad. And uh, well, so uh, now one can define uh, using this uh, point of view of the generalized hitching vibration that Professor Ngo explained in the first in the first session of this workshop. One can consider this uh, a multiplicative hitching map for this uh, monoid. So a hitching map for this monoid. So one starts by considering the the invariant theory for the monoid. Um, if M is a very flat reductive monoid, then uh, the the GIT quotient of of yes. So this is now the ax the adjoint action. So before I was considering GIT quotient by uh, G cross G. Now I'm just considering action of G. So this is the adjoint action. And if I take the GIT quotient, I just take I just get this uh, quotient which. I already explained times the abelianization. So now I can consider a multiplicative hitching map associated basically to this sequence of stacks. So I first have the, ax the adjoint action of G and the action of this uh, center, the monoid. Then I can quotient, I can take the GIT quotient by the group and get here. So this is basically the hitching vibration in this case. And then the map here just amounts to fix the singular, the singularities to so prescribe the singularities. And then I have another map to to bundles of for this uh, torus. So this is like a hitching vibration. Well, this is the hitching vibration. This just amounts to fixing singularities. And the thing is that this is just the the, the thing I was talking about just uh, before. Um, so how do you compare the two pictures? You start with this sample of, of dominant coweights, then consider the image. So they consider the map they define from, from the multiplicative group uh, to T to your torus. This is like a multiplicative uh, map. And this must uh, extend to the abelianization just because how this abelianization was defined, right? I mean, because it is a toric variety with the appropriate coordinates. So then uh, if I consider the corresponding very flat monoid associated to this map, so the pullback, um, then, uh, okay, so in this case, this, uh, this is just the power of the Picard. So if I have any tuple of line bundles, I can define this uh, bundle over pick uh, n, and this uh, will give me my singularities. And so since all these divisors are effective, uh, they have canonical sections, we can consider these canonical sections and the bundle defined by the sum of these uh, divisors. And well, uh, this is, I guess this is essentially in Boutier's work, but I mean, as I said, uh, probably written, I mean, it's like a combination of everything. So this map just defines uh, uh, this diagram, this Cartesian diagram. So this is what I meant by, uh, you can recover this, let's say naive description of, of, of the multiplicative hitching vibration in terms of this uh, hitching vibration for monoids. So, uh, now I'm going to move on to involutions. So I'll start by saying something about usual Higgs bundles and involutions. Why should one care about this? So um, G as before, now I fix an involution of G. So an order two automorphism, I can consider the fixed points. This is in general not, well, Actually, since I fix G to be simply connected, uh, this is connected, but if not, I have to take the, the connected component. And then uh, this is the normalizer of, of G theta, which can be just described as the points 
which are fixed up to an element of the center. And I have this Cartan decomposition that has also appeared like in Thomas' talk and in Spencer Leslie's talk. And um, this is the stack of G theta Higgs bundles. So in the literature, these are usually called Higgs bundles for real groups, but these are the, the same thing. And our motivation, of course, is to study the multiplicative analog of, of this theory. Um, so why, why would someone care about the additive analog of this theory to begin with? So, well, I have, I have here some reasons for that. Also, I should mention that maybe uh, probably like Spencer Leslie will care about this for different reasons, but um, this is the, um, one of the reasons is because under the non-abelian host correspondence, they, they correspond to real, to re representations in the real form. They also appeared as fixed points of involution. This is the work of uh, Oscar and, and Ramana. And also, um, conjecturally, they give the support of some uh, brain dual to the brain given by the Nadler dual group of, of this uh, pair. So I think this is enough motivation. I now have to introduce some data related to this involution that have already been introduced, so, so it's not new. I mean, it's not new in this uh, conference. So I start uh, with this G and this involution, and then um, I'm going a little bit too fast. <laughs> so um, yes, uh, I, I, I fix. I consider some maximal theta split toras. So a, a toras is theta split if the involution acts on it as anti-fixed points. And um, if I fix a maximal toras containing it, then this is a theta stable. So uh, it's known that theta acts, I mean, it's easy to say that theta acts on the roots. Um, this is another characterization of the quasi-split condition that has been uh, also mentioned a lot in these talks. Uh, so that no root is fixed under this involution. This is equivalent to being quasi-split. I just mentioned it. But in any case, we can consider this restricted root system. So if we consider the roots that are not fixed, we just... Uh, take this uh, combination and we get these uh, restricted roots. So this is a, a equivalent to restrict the roots to, to this torus. So this is a root system which might be non-reduced non in some cases and has this vial group that is called the little vial group. So something I want to say about this root system is that if you compute its root lattice, is just um, the characters of this torus. So this is the my maximal theta split torus, but I quotient it by the intersection with uh, this normalizer of fixed points. So this intersection is just uh, elements that are elements of A that are or of order two up to the center, and the white lattice is the intersection with the fixed points. So these are the elements which are of order two. Um, so for this lattice, I have generators, which are the simple restricted roots. And for this white lattice, I'm going to fix generators that can actually be computed in terms of the dominant uh, weights of T. But I'll denote them like this. Um, okay. So now I can consider this uh, multiplicative Higgs bundles associated to an involution. I'll first do it in, like in the naive, naive way. So uh, what should be a multiplicative G theta Higgs bundle? So as, uh, as before, I start with this uh, device or this symmetric product, and I just consider pairs where E is now a bundle with a structure group the fixed points, this G theta. And my Higgs field takes values. So if in the group case, it, take, it took values in the group, 
Now I'm going to take values in this uh, symmetric variety. And again, I consider meromorphic sections. So for any point, we get some local invariant, which will lie now in this, uh, in this uh, coset space. So I take, I take uh, formal loops in the symmetric variety and I cosent it by positive loops of the group. And for this uh, thing, I also have some kind of Cartan decomposition. So, well, this is part, I mean, this is just uh, some classical result in the theory of <clears throat> homogeneous spaces or, but well, in this context, probably the original reference is uh, some paper by Yosawa that they haven't found, been able to find, but <laughs> I know it, it exists. <laughs> uh, and it is con contained in the work of, uh, Luna and Vust on spherical varieties, and uh, it's also in Nadler. But actually, uh, I didn't. I wasn't going to give any argument about this. But uh, now that we are all experts in the spherical varieties, I can say a little bit more. So the idea is to consider. So instead of G sub, mod G super theta, I consider G mod its norm, normalizer. So that is a homogeneous space which admits a wonderful compactification. And then I can apply this uh, local structure theorem, which basically will reduce everything to, to, to this cell that uh, Professor Brion uh, explained. So that cell in this case is just a, a toric variety for this torus, or rather for here with the G sub theta. And uh, and precisely, I mean, if I, if I reduce there, then I, I just see that what I must get are these uh, these uh, co-weights. So I mean, it's actually easy with all that we know. And uh, then in that case, I can also prescribe the singularities as a tuple by fixing a tuple in this uh, uh, of elements of this uh, lattice, well, not part of a lattice. And, and just asking them to have an invariant bounded by this uh, device. So uh, I want to, to notice something here. So here I could have changed G theta by any closed uh, subgroup of G. And I could have defined this like for uh, homogeneous spaces, right? Like I, some H inside of G, I just take H bundles and I take uh, a Higgs field with values in the homogeneous space. Now, um, for if G mod H is a spherical homogeneous space, I have a very similar description of this. And actually, even if it is not a spherical, this is basically the, I think this is basically the intersection of some valuation cone intersection with some lattice. So, I also have a nice description of this, and then I can also give this definition. So, so what I mean is that uh, this part of the talk could be maybe is very easily gen generalized to other homogeneous uh, spaces for for G. But now this next part cannot. <laughs> so uh, the nice thing about uh, symmetric spaces is that we also have some kind of multiplicative uh, Chevalier restriction. So this is like a multiplicative analog of uh, the work of Costan and Rallis. So <clears throat> if I take the G theta invariants of the symmetric space, um, these are just like the invariants by the little byte group of this, uh, this torus. And <clears throat> well, if I assume since I assume that G is simply connected, then uh, I also know that this quotient it must be a, an affine space. So if I didn't assume G is simply connected, then this is not true in general. Uh, you can read Richardson papers where he gives contracts actually a characterization of when this quotient is an affine space. But in the case I am considering, it always is. So these are functions with the weights, precisely the weights associated to this uh, involution. And then I can define a multiplicative hitching map for this, 
which is very similar to the thing we did uh, for the group. So just, um, I consider this bundle of, of pitching bases, and then I consider the image through these uh, functions. So uh, as for the usual multiplicative hitching vibration, we had a monoid approach. Now we have an approach by considering uh, symmetric embeddings. So I now take a, any reductive group. So I, my G was already fixed. I now take some G1, which can be any reductive group. So, well, you already know this, but uh, by a symmetric G1 variety, I just mean some homogeneous space of this form where uh, H1 is, is some group lying uh, in between the connected component of the fixed points and this normalizer for some involution of the, of the original group. So something that uh, it's easy to see is that any symmetric variety is of this form. So, I mean, the, the big group I can just take to be the product of, of it's the, the right group of G1 times some toras. And, and H be a symmetric uh, subgroup associated to uh, this involution. So to some involution on the derived part, on the semi-simple part, and in the toras, I just take uh, the, the inverse. So this is like a, a split toras. So this, uh, if, if I now take this other symmetric variety, I, I call that, I call this just the semi-simple part of the biggest uh, symmetric variety. And now I want to consider embeddings of this. So uh, uh, an embedding, I mean, by a symmetric embedding, I just mean a, an embedding of a symmetric mm -hmm. variety. So this is just a normal uh, G1 variety with with a uh, open embedding. And uh, so now this has to do with the theory, general theory of, of spherical varieties. Uh, as for, uh, any of these varieties is, is, is said to be simple if it only has one closed G orbit. So um, recall from the previous slide that uh, this always has to have this form. I mean, this can I can I can take O sigma this uh, symmetric uh, variety to have this form. So now I have two different tories tori uh, associated to to this variety, which will be interesting. This is just uh, this set modulo or, uh, elements of order two, and this is a slightly different. This is the same torus set, but I quotient by this H. Uh, projected inside of uh, set. And now I can also talk about abelianization in this context. So abelianization is just this GIT quotient by this uh, derived uh, group. And uh, this is a toric variety for this uh, torus. And in this case, I can also talk about what uh, does it mean to be very flat. So completely analogous, I can say that this is very flat. If this map is dominant flat and with uh, integral fibers. So um, I can also talk about uh, this several similar category and about an envelope in embedding very similar to the Finberg uh, embedding, Binberg monoid. So I, I, I start with my previous notation of GR uh, semi simple simply connected group, <coughs> theta and evolution, T the, uh, maximal torus, A a uh, maximal uh, theta split torus. And then uh, this category of very flat symmetric embeddings with fixed semi simple part to be G mod G theta and with excellent morphisms as a versal object, which is called the uh, I call it the envelope in embedding, but this is due to, well, to Gate. So this is just a theorem by uh, Nicola Gate. Um, so this embedding can be uh, described very similarly to, to the description of the Bimber embedding. Uh, this is not so natural, like 
uh, probably when one con I mean, when one considers embeddings of uh, homogeneous spaces, the natural thing is to say, okay, so these are the colors and these are the these are the evaluations, or or in this case, since it is an affine embedding, this is just the cone of 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 weights. But you can do something similar if you want. I mean, this is just like a didactic approach to do this. So you you so. The enveloping embedding has as open orbit this quotient. So this is G times this uh, theta split torus and a quotient by this uh, subgroup, which is, uh, so the first component are uh, elements of order two inside this uh, theta split torus times uh, elements of order two up to the center. And the second component are elements uh, of the fixed points of G times these elements of order two up to the center. And uh, I can obtain this uh, gay embedding as the closure of the image of this uh, map. So here, instead of considering here the representation, I just consider a basis of this module and then I consider this as an affine space. But uh, it's basically the same thing. What uh, I mean, what is important to notice about this uh, enveloping embedding is that it has as a story associated to it precisely this uh, torus moduli modulo the uh, order two elements and the same torus modulo the order two elements up to the center and the abelianization is defined by these restricted roots like the coordinates are these restricted roots. Now with a minus because um, this is like some technicalities. Um, okay, so now I can talk about a multiplicative hitching map for a, associated to a very flat symmetric embeddings, embedding. So uh, you can study the the GAT quotient of a very flat symmetric embedding, and it's. Uh, by arguments very similar that one can give for groups, you get that this is just the GAT quotient of Richardson that I already explained times uh, this abelianization. And then uh, as for the groups, I can consider a, a multiplicative hitching map associated uh, induced by this sequence of Saki quotients. So, uh, so yeah, I, I start with this very flat uh, symmetric uh, embedding. And this, I have an action of this G theta and of this uh, of this torus. Then I take the GIT quotient. I still have an action of the torus. Then I go to the abelian. So the, this would be the Hitchin vibration. Then I go to the abelianization to fix the, the, the invariants. And then I can go further to these um, bundles of with group this said uh, sigma. Okay, so <clears throat> again I can compare the two pictures. Um, I have this tuple of weights, co weights, and this define a uh, map to this uh, tori. Okay, so yeah, here I consider that this is embedding inside of this, just for convenience. So this extends to this uh, abelianization, just again, because of the properties of this abelianization, what, how it is defined, basically, sorry. And um, I can consider again, the corresponding very flat symmetric uh, embedding as a pullback of this map, and uh, again, uh, this B is just uh, some power of Picard. So I just have to fix some tuple of line bundles. And <laughs> my uh, space of uh, meromorphic data in some sense uh, is, is basically this bundle. Um, so then I can again compare the two pictures, <clears throat> fixing these uh, sections against is the device or side effective. <laughs> and what uh, we have done is just compare the two pictures and see that this naive uh, <laughs> definition of the of the 
multiplicative hitching map can be uh, seen inside this general uh, story of uh, multiplicative hitching maps for uh, very flat symmetric varieties. Okay, so now I'm going to change uh, the topic a little bit, just a little bit, and see how these uh, objects appear as fixed points of of the um, multiplica of the modulus stack of well, modular space of simple multiplicative uh, Higgs bundles. So, um, well, I just consider, yeah, so some notation I, I denote by phi this map from uh, automorphisms to uh, the outer automorphism group. And uh, if I have any, any class of, uh, any class of involutions inside of, the outer automorphism group, and I fix a, any number plus or minus one, then uh, I can consider this involution for uh, multiplicative Higgs bundles. So uh, this is very similar to the involutions considered by uh, Oscar and Ramanan that uh, have been mentioned several times. So I just take some, uh, the, the principal bundle, I take it to, to theta of that. So <laughs> Just the the, um, the same total space with the action twisted by theta, and then uh, inside of this bundle, I can consider the same phi. This will be theta of phi, and I can also uh, elev exponentiate to minus. I can take the inf inverse if, if I want. So notice that so uh, in Oscar and Ramanan the paper they put the epsilon here, like in front of the Higgs field. Now, since this is multiplicative, I, I take it here. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, uh, so I can define this for any evolution, but rather uh, the only th thing I really care about is the, the outer class of, of the evolution since uh, it doesn't change, it's the same evolution at the level of uh, Higgs bundles. So of course, our, our goal is to study the fixed points of this uh, involution. So one, the first thing one notices is that uh, multiplicative G theta Higgs bundles, so multiplicative Higgs bundles for this group are fixed under the positive involution. And these uh, multiplicative Higgs bundles for the symmetric variety are fixed under the minus one involution. So I now have to uh, say a little, some things about involution, some technicalities and set some notations. So bear with me for a minute. Um, so one thing I want to consider is that uh, this theta twisted conjugation action of uh, G on itself induced by uh, an evolution. So this theta twisted conjugation action has a lot of orbits. And all these orbits are homogeneous spaces uh, of this form. So G mod uh, G theta S, where theta S is a different automorphism. So this automorphism in general is not an involution. It will be an involution if and only if S lives in this special uh, subset, which are uh, elements which are uh, under the involution, they go to their inverse up to an element of the center. And this uh, theta twisted conjugation actually preserves, uh, well, this theta twisted conjugation can be extended to an action also of the center just by multiplication. And that action preserves this, uh, this set. And well, these two symmetric uh, varieties can be identified if and only if the two involutions are related. So not only that, it's not only that they are in the same outer class, but rather that they are uh, conjugated by, they are conjugated by an inner, uh, by an inner automorphism. So being in the same outer class would be this, but I want something stronger, which is this. And then this map uh, descends to what uh, Oscar and Ramanan call this uh, click map. And uh, these clicks, so this uh, inverse image of uh, outer uh, classes here are just these uh, orbits. 
by this action. And well, I should mention that they also admit some description in terms of non-abelian group cohomology that might be interesting. I mean, it is interesting, you know. <laughs> um, so now I, here's the description of the fixed point. So, well, I have to assume that my pair is simple in order to give a, a good description of the fixed points. Oh, here I should have written yota a, a, a epsilon of e phi. So this is like the most, I mean, this is fixed points in this sense. So this first statement is actually due to Oscar and Romana. So if, if this is just has to do with, with, the, with the bundle, if E is fixed under this involution, then there is a unique, uh, there, there is a unique outer class inside this click. So I remember, I remind you that this click was the pre-image of this map. So it, it so not outer class. It has it is a collection of uh, classes uh, in here. So there is a unique class such that um, there is a reduction of the structure group of this uh, e to a g theta bundle for this theta. <laughs> and now if we restrict uh, the the map, so, okay, let me, so uh, I can now regard the Higgs field as a, as a G equivalent map from this bundle to, to G. So if I restrict this map to this uh, E theta, uh, what I see is that uh, this map will take values in G theta if epsilon is one, so in the positive case, but in the negative case, this take values in the anti-fixed points of the group. So the thing is that anti-fixed points of the group is not just one symmetric variety, but it is a collection of symmetric varieties. Um, so what I know is that at least it lies inside of one of these symmetric varieties, right? Because uh, this is this is just a connectedness uh, argument. So what I know is that okay, it lies inside of here, but just in one connected component. But uh, what I want to notice is that this this connected component might not be uh, g mod g theta, but rather it could be g mod g theta s, where theta s is some. Uh, some inner uh, modification of, of theta. So, well, I mean, this is a, a, a big difference with the additive case where I, I always uh, go to the, to the real, uh, to, 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 to the fixed bundles for the real form here. I have some things that are a little bit uh, weird because they have the, the they have the, the structure group here, but uh, the, the Higgs field takes values here. This acts through the theta twisted uh, action. So I mean, this makes sense. Uh, okay, so this is actually not hard to prove. Um, so just uh, if 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 something is a fixed point of this then uh, there, there, it, it must have some, uh, some automorphism, which is not actually an automorphism, but a theta twisted automorphism. So it, it does not compose right. And this automorphism has a, a, an associated map, which actually, instead of going to G, it goes to this uh, S sub theta zero. So uh, again, connectedness arguments tell you that they must map to a single orbit, so to a single homogeneous space. So this already gives you the reduction to the <coughs> of the structural group. And then uh, by assumption, if you unravel this uh, being a fixed point, this is just this condition. So if you have E uh, such that F psi of E uh, is fixed, then you just get, sorry, this. Um, this actually would be some theta s, right? Some different. 
Okay, so this is the description of the fixed points. Now I should say how mm, this relates to the symplectic structure. So I didn't say anything about this yet, but uh, when X is Calabillao, so it is essentially an elliptic core, but also, I mean, since I didn't assume it to be proper, though I might have, uh, I can also assume that X is, X is the uh, affine line or, or the multiplicative group. group. Then in the original paper by Octobis and Markman, they define some algebraic symplectic structure in the modular space of simple multiplicative Higgs bundles. Now it's with a fixed invariant, so it's a little bit different to what I did. I mean, to the stack that we are considering. So what we consider is if uh, how this involution relates to this uh, algebraic symplectic structure. And as we expected, we show that um, precisely uh, the positive one respects the, the, the symplectic structure and the negative one uh, exchanges it by uh, minus. So the fixed points will give uh, something which is algebraic symplectic. So think of BBB brain, <laughs> suggests BBB brain, right? And the uh, I minus will form an algebraic Lagrangian. So this suggests BAA brain, right? BAA brain. So um, now to finish, I will say a little bit about the relation with monopoles. I still have time. So, so uh, I will explain very quickly and without much detail this uh, correspondence by Chacono and Octubis. So now I have to work over C and in the analytic category. So uh, these multiplicative Higgs, G Higgs bundles are very easily shown to be in correspondence to this. Uh, so this is, uh, I think this terminology was introduced by Professor Mochizuki. Uh, this mini holomorphic G bundles that have uh, Dirac type singularities. Um, I think I'm not going to define mini holomorphic yet because uh, it will be easily easier to define it from the other side. So uh, bear with me for a second. And if I take such a mini holomorphic bundle, which is an object defined over my curve times uh, the circle, then um, and I fix some, let's say, an Hermitian metric then I can consider some, uh, instead of a chair connection, in this case, I have some chair pair, which is formed by a connection, a unitary connection and some Higgs field. Now this Higgs field is very different to the other Higgs fields, right? I mean, it's Higgs field in a different context. And uh, one can show that uh, if some ad hoc stability conditions are satisfied, then uh, basically using the Donaldson's, the not Donaldson Lembeck Yao theorem, or some a slight modification of that in this uh, curve times the torus, one can obtain a, such a canonical metric such that this uh, thing is actually a monopole. So it, it's, it solves this uh, Hermitian Einstein Bogomolny equation. So it's like a Hermitian Einstein monopole. So, um, now from the other direction, it's easier to see what is a mini holomorphic G bundle. So uh, this is from the classical theory of monopoles. I don't know if this is like Atiyah or Hitchin or... <laughs> so to, uh, to any monopole you can... So if, if you have the, this pair, so a connection and this uh, Higgs field, which is a section of some associated uh, bundle of uh, the algebras, using the connection, you can obtain a... Uh, a uh, holomorphic, so, so a Dolbo operator on X, and uh, combining the component of the connection in the S1 and this Higgs field, one can consider this uh, a scattering operator. So the combination of this Dolbo operator and this uh, scattering operator give you this mini holomorphic structure. And if you take holonomy through that scattering operator, then you get the, the multiplicative Higgs field. That's the, that's the upshot of this uh, Chaponot to this correspondence. 
So um, what we uh, have been interested in doing is just these involutions that we consider. So to study them from the other side of the Chapman O to this correspondence. So um, what we think is that, um, well, since if I would is obtained by taking this uh, scattering by, of some mini holomorphic bundle, then uh, E phi minus one, this different uh, multiplicative Higgs bundle should be obtained by taking a scattering holonomy in the opposite direction. So the, the way to do this is just to pull back through this uh, change in the, to this evolution in the, in the circle. So at this in terms of mini holomorphic bundles, we know which are the evolutions one must consider. The positive is just take the associated uh, bundle with uh, theta. And here one just has to pull back through this uh, map. So we think the description, of, let's say, of the involutions in monopoles and of the fixed points should follow from here. So this is uh, still work in progress or forthcoming work with uh, Oscar. Okay, so I'll finish by telling what, which are the further direction that one might, might take from here. So then the first there's this uh, monopole and involution, which is uh, forthcoming. So something else that uh, must be regarded here is the Langlands duality for multiplicative heat in vibration, no, no involution yet. And then maybe a study brains inside of there uh, and see if this thing I said about brains, uh, how it behaves and everything. So uh, Benedict and I have already some ideas uh, regarding this. Then um, another interesting uh, problem is, so we formulated some kind of hitting vibration. So the, the natural thing, if you want, well, the natural thing now, if one, wants to study this heating vibration is to study the regular quotient. So we are we have this class of heating vibrations for very flat uh, symmetric embeddings. Um, so one should try to study this uh, regular quotient. Um, so this is uh, quite complicated because, uh, well, there is, uh, of course, the regular quotient in the additive case is now very well known and understood by Thomas and Benedict. Uh, I think uh, the regular quotient for the group has also been studied by uh, Professor Ngo and by Benedict. So this is also, I think, more or less known, but this, uh, it's a state not known and it will present uh, the, the problems of those two cases. Um, also, one will need a notion of mm, some constant radix sections that uh, in this case we still don't have. So, so that's another uh, direction that one should study. So one has this uh, GAT quotient. Um, so what about sections of this? And uh, something more. Uh, so of course, there's the point of the generalization to spherical varieties and maybe beyond. So um, several problems here are, well, a first problem is that, well, <laughs> first question would be what, what is the analog of this uh, enveloping embedding? So, Maybe the, this uh, spectrum of the Cox ring is the right thing to look at. Might be, but um, we are still not sure because um, we, we are still not clear about the relationship between this uh, gay embedding and this spectrum of the Cox ring. There are some subtle, some subtle points there that need to be clarified. Um, of course, then there's the, the issue of describing this GIT quotient, which for uh, symmetric varieties, we already have some information on. Slide, time, sorry. Um, 
W theta times the abelian agitation. But um, so a Chevalier restriction map for the spherical varieties, as far as I know, is not really very well known. Um, of course, there's Luna Richardson theorem, but that might not give you the right thing or a thing that you are interested in. It's useful. So this is still very, very open and quite vague. But some things are clearly, will clearly be easy to generalize, like the very flat uh, abelianization, all that I think will be easy. And maybe beyond spherical varieties, right? So other homogeneous spaces, for example, theta order greater than two or general G varieties, who knows? And of course, there's the issue of if this has applications to, let's say, to the fundament, some version of the fundamental lemma and, and the relative Langdas program or something like that, which I uh, don't know. So uh, this is all, uh, thank you. Questions? Yeah. So the exponential, I think the G equivalent and the LG, the reading, so, okay, not that bad. But can you, is there a relationship between the entity and the not technical team teaching? So I have not, I, that's funny because Arpan, who is over there, uh, asked me that also a long time ago. So I should have thought about that, but I, I, I really haven't. <laughs> you can do it formally. I yeah, but formally around the, the zero, yeah, in the algebra, and then it's somehow algebraic, but it's formal, so mm -hmm. everything may be just around the formal way of the of the bounds of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that would be very nice. Uh, more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, at the in the theorem, you have this, uh, it lands in one of the components of this, this uh, inverse. You mean uh, in the fixed points? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Uh, is there any way of, like, can you say which component it lands in? Yeah. Or is it somehow dependent upon this choice? I mean, yes. So, so you just have to evaluate um, this if, I mean, once you have the, the um, the theta twisted automorphism, you have this map, you just have to evaluate in some point. And if you know which, so you get, if you evaluate in some point, you get some S here. So that gives you basically the involution in which. Uh, so it depends uh, on the theta not. No, no, no. It does not depend on, on theta not. It, it depends just on the. So in some sense, this is uh, once you fix a uh, theta twisted automorphism. So it, it depends on the theta twisted automorphism. I mean, yeah, because it's just the actually. So uh, something else can be said. So if if my phi if if, my, if there's some point in E where this phi takes a value in a semi-simple uh, element of the group or a unipotent element of the group, then you know that uh, you, mu you must land in the, in the symmetric variety actually. Because um, if you have that, then I mean, you know that you land here, but you must be, you must be in there because Semi simple point right. in here must be there. There's a question over there. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm sorry, this was just thinking about the previous discussion. Uh -huh. So, is there, um, so in the, in the, for the Lee algebra, for the non multiplicative thing, there's a special, um, there's a special properties if you take the canonical. Oh. And do you see anything of the, the form here? Do you look at the deformation theory of your bundle? Yes, I mean, this is kind of hidden. So um, note that the, the um, in some sense, I'm always, I'm always considering twisting by, 
by affective de affective divisor. So it is like, uh, in some sense, I'm always twisted by the trivial bundle. In some sense. Um, so uh, when is the canonical bundle trivial? That's precisely when X is Calabi-Yau, and it's precisely when X is Calabi-Yau that you have a symplectic structure. That's, uh, that's kind of the, I mean, So, I mean, for uh, each one, you rarely fix the canonical divisor as this fix the canonical divisor, but you fix the canonical class. So, in, in principle, this yes. would also be fibered over some symmetric product, but then you would consider sort of the, the, the projective sections of Kx, and this would give you something special. Not sure I. <laughs> We need that first when you take the degree of the omega i lambda and you sum over all omega i, then uh, depending of uh, the degree of this line bundle uh, regarding to the genus of the curve. Mm -hmm. So usually, for instance, if you want uh, some total space or the open to be smooth, then you say, okay, the degree of the omega i lambda has to be greater than the g minus one or g minus two. Well, maybe it's a point to stop there and thank Guillermo again for his 